<laughs> you know, I, I uh, came from a family who has always had a workshop. And when I was about 10 years old, maybe something, 11, uh, there was a fire in the Sp Scanspeak factory. Uh, and, and after that, my father and a colleague of his bought all the drivers from the insurance company, all the leftover drivers. So when I was growing up, I always had a cabinet full of speaker drivers. So when I got a little older and could run machines, I started building from the Scanspeak drivers and the board coils and caps we had. So I learned the basics there. Um, so I think I've, I've in, a, in a way, always had that passion for creating things. Uh, and, and it's also the way I work now is I, I make things for me. I, 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 it's not necessarily uh, um, high-end audio. It's also been other interests during my life. I used to sail and raise dignities. I make parts, center boards and rudders for that. I did triathlon, so I made uh, bicycle frames so I could race the bikes. So I've always been sort of like interested in, in the things that where my, my interests are focused, where my passions are. And, and of course, now that uh, this has become a business for me, of course, now the passion is, uh, is even stronger. And it still works that way. It still works that way. So when we did the new birth and speakers, the first year or so, I had the speakers at home, the cabinets, the drivers, tweaking, experimenting, changing, uh, nerding out, really. I think it's a very much this a, is a line through that. You know, the Rido company started as uh, out as my company together with Lars, and then then Dantux bought into the company after the financial crisis, where our existing uh, financial partners had to pull out. So that was the time there became a, a different ownership. So actually, me departing from Rido was like like getting a divorce from my own kids. And, and, and of course, all the experience you, you gain through working for, for I think I was, with, I started right in 2001, so it's like 16 years I've been working with that brand. Of course, all the things you learn, it's like a progression. Every, every day, I, I always say to, to, to Lars that, that, that every time we finish a product, we know exactly what to do to make it better. Because once you finish a product, you know it from the inside to the outside. And you also know, know, know where you made something that in hindsight could have been done a little bit different. And when you sum up all these things, everything becomes a progression moving forward all the time. The thing is that when, when, you, when you sort of like depart from something, you also get a fresh canvas. So you could basically start over so, so, so what we did with Ryder was that we, uh, or with the, the bars and speakers is, is we, 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 in a way, kept the elements that we knew were really, really good and made them better. So the tweeter we have is pretty much an evolution of what, what I made for Ryder. But the, the original Ryder design, I made that in 1998, the, the tweeter. And then in 2001, Rido was founded on that tweeter. But actually, I was making the tweeter, and I tried to, to, to make it available to, to clients on direct base or through ScanSpeak or whatever. But nobody was really interested uh, because, because it was not very loud. But it, it was not very loud because it had all these silent qualities, um, no noise, no trans, uh, transmission noise, no distortion. So... So naturally, that concept, that was actually, that was also a develop of something that I did in the 80s. That was also a part of what Philips did in the 80s with the with their plane of ribbon. And it's all, always been a progression of that and saying, how do you make a better, more straight, more homogeneous magnetic field that are stronger? And material evolution makes it possible with certain increments in time to make something that is significantly better. 
So what we have achieved here is that we have achieved a very, very high sensitivity. We have reduced or halved the membrane weight. And, 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 and when you do that, you also half the stored energy. And you, that means all the possible noise that the, the tweeter can generate by itself is also halved. So the tweeter performance by doing these things is simply much, much, much better. It's in a different league. Also from Rido, also from Rido, I, I I knew I had to work with stiff membranes. Uh, so 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 we looked pretty much at 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 making. I made the first ceramic membranes in in 2005, I think, and that was started out like an aluminium core, and then there were ceramic layers added to that. So we essentially got a sandwich where we got the stiffness from the ceramic added the damping of the softer aluminum in the middle, so that sandwich was good. And when we layered that up with even more layers, uh, with the diamond layers or the tantalium layers, it got even better, that membrane. But it had one drawback, that is, and that's also the drawback of the acutons, is that that ceramic membrane is heavy. So I looked at how, how, how do I make rigid structures that are lighter and that's very easy because that's look at uh, racing sailboats. So look at Formula One, see how do they make light and stiff materials. And they all go into carbon honeycomb solutions. So that's the kind of membrane we have here. And that, that took away five grams of moving mass in the membrane. And that's, that's, that's quite a lot. Yes, well, by, by taking away all that moving mass, the definition of the mid-range becomes uh, a magnitude higher. But what really, what really creates the uniqueness is that, that we all, in Rider we chased efficiency. And we could make the drivers more efficient by adding more iron. But every time we added more iron, I felt the speakers were more visible. So maybe they were playing louder, but they were also more visible. You had more of this sound more like a speaker rather than sound like music. Can you sense that? So I, I was pretty much aware that I needed to find a way to take iron out of the drivers. And, and when I left Rydal, I knew in, in my mind that that was a task, but I had not yet found the configuration where that was possible. But then I started look at, looking at how uh, the Apogees uh, and also my planar magnetic driver had that uh, magnet uh, field going from a plus to a minus from a, uh, on a flat. And I, uh, the problem with that is that it is a very uneven, that kind. But then I thought, what if we do two of those and add them on top of the other and make it in circular magnets? And that was actually the key. Once I found that, I could design all iron out of the driver. And then, and then the, where the pole pieces are, where the voice coils are, are replaced with uh, uh, pure copper rings. And that has a profound impact on driver inductance. And if you know how a, a dynamic driver works, uh, you you get a force on a membrane stemming from the current in the voice coil and the length of the voice coil and that is multiplied with the magnetic force. But the magnetic force is the sum of the stationary magnetic field created by the permanent magnets you have in the magnetic motor and the contribution from the magnetic field that the voice coil creates because it's a voice coil, it has inductance. So when you put current through it, it creates a magnetic field, but that sums up with the magnetic field that you have, have with the permanent magnets. So, 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 so the, the, the driver voice coil influences the forces, the magnetic force that you have that is available. And of course, in a direction where it has to create more force as it increases the field, it's very difficult if you have iron that is pushed very close to saturation. 
But in the other direction where you have to relax the magnetism in the ion, it's very easy. And I believe that is the essence of what we call ion distortion. That unlinear element and on a stationary signal, on a sign, it's very little, but on a dynamic scale, it's very big because you have these pulses of current going through the system. So you have big changes of ma the magnetics in, in either direction. Um, and when you have an ion based, the voice coil inductance goes go up and that is a reflection of that magnetism because the magnetism, the AC magnetism is, is direct proportion to the inductance of the voice coil. And when you take the iron out and replace that with copper rings, inductance goes down. And it goes down by a huge magnitude. An example is the voice coil we use, if we take it out of the magnetic system and measure the inductance, it's half a millihenry. And when we put it down in the magnetic gap in the copper rings, it's 0 0.04 millihenry. So that's more than, that's 96% of the inductance that goes out by doing this. What's achieved is that, that, that it, the forces that react or, or drive the membrane are more, are more true to the music. They are not uh, dynamically compressed and they are not lagging behind. They are not, they're simply more accurate and the driver is much faster and has higher resolution. So, so what, what, we, what we achieve is that that element of a speaker sounded like a speaker disappears. It goes out. Yes. Yeah, but, but when, you, when you start out creating a new speaker with completely new and different drivers, it's very hard to compare to what you came from. Because you don't really, you don't really know where all the changes come from. If I just put this kind of magnet system on a rider driver, then I would know what the magnet system does. But this is a sum of uh, different cone material, lighter cones, different surrounds, different spider, different voice coil. So everything, there's, there's not a part that you can transfer directly. And when that is not, it's, it's, it's a completely different driver. So it's very hard to, uh, but of course, but of course, you know, with the experience I have, I know that that if I make elements better and the sum is not better, then there's other parts of the sum that I need to look at. Uh, so, 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 of course, in my opinion, what we have now is much, much better in all respects. Uh, more efficient, measures better, sounds better, more dynamic and a lot higher resolution, uh, but, but, but it is a new task. You're, you're put up with a new task when you do something new. I, 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 <laughs> um, I, for, for the first series I made, the, the, the birth and series, they are quite narrow and quite tall and quite, and, and I think that I always, I, I thought that the, the, the old designs uh, from Franco uh, down in Italy, down uh, down in Italy at uh, what is uh, what is it, Franco? What is his name? The speakers from Italy, the Cremonas, the Stradivari, the you know, uh, I cannot remember the company, but I can remember the speaker names. And I think they were so wonderful, and that boat shape and that elegance they had. And uh, so, so I, 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 I warned, and, and then Franco died. So when I made the first bars and speakers, I actually thought of them as, as sort of like a tribute or an ode to, to, to Franco's design. Um, so, so I think my inspiration is there and, uh, and maritime uh, wood things. Uh, but actually, uh, I made a new series of speakers called the set speakers that are just out now, or just we start started shipping, which are more are, are wider or more sturdy in a way, it has eight inch drivers, so they are quite a big bit of, uh, wider. 
I, I think that that. I think the narrow baffle has this uh, cunning ability to disappear in the picture. I, I think that that our f- front plates are elliptical, so we try by by having this elliptical shape, we try to minimize the edge diffractions. But there's always a baffle step when when you put a driver into a baffle that has a certain width. You have sort of like uh, when the pressure is below uh, a certain frequency which relate to the width of the baffle, you 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 start beaming energy forward. So you have a, a rise in the energy going forward, and you have that at a higher frequency point with a narrower baffle than you do with a wider baffle. So so the narrower baffle pushes off up the baffle step. So by having a narrow baffle, the crossover of the mid-range and the baffle step are about the same things. Uh, so, so you actually start to have a rise in the frequency response where you want also to have a roll-off. But this then you can compensate with, with simply placing your filter a little lower so it takes out the baffle step and makes the crossover in one go. If you have a wider baffle, you need to deal with these things in, in, in two separate part, sections of the crossover. And then everything becomes a little more complex. So my, my, my speakers with the, the Burrs and speakers, the Burrs in 01, 02, 03, and, and 05, they all run a crossover that is a serial crossover where the drivers are connected. And then if you want to make suctions and frequency compensation, it becomes extremely difficult because what you do to one driver is reflected in the other driver. So if you suck out energy here, you actually push it up there instead. So, 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 so this manipulation uh, with the driver frequency response, uh, one driver at the time in the bars and speakers is very, very difficult. And that's one reason why the baffle is kept fairly narrow. I think I think the key is that we we made a driver that is very hard to overload. So you can you can so you can push the driver very hard and you just run into a soft uh, braking or soft compression rather than into an abrupt clipping. So, 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 so the, the, the way to make a small speaker sound big is actually to, to not try to make it go too low. If you, really, if you really push for frequency band extension, then you run into loading problems. I, I, uh, I'm currently working on an idea that we are just basically starting to test out where we want to make an analog way of making room compensation. And, this, and, and, and in general, I think putting subwoofers on is very difficult, especially when you have a driver that is very fast. Then, uh, then most subwoofers today have some kind of DSP compensation. And then in a DSP, you have maybe 15, maybe 20 milliseconds delay, and you have a slow driver. So how do you ever get that to match? Now, now I, personally, I find room corrections to be a little bit stupid uh, because, because in a room, there's basically only one thing that is annoying, and that is that... You, you, you can sort of divide the, the room response to reflection. You have reflective, you have reflective base and you have position base nodes, but those are not really the issue. The issue is you also get a pressure node. That's where base become really unpleasant. That is when you get this, poof, this pressure. And that pressure is typically related to the volume of the room. So this volume resonance is really the, the annoying thing. And my idea is basically you just ditch all the other positional resonances and say those are part of 
what gives the room the character and the sonics of that room. You don't really want to take that away because your body adjusts to that. But the pressure you want to take away. So if you can measure where you have the pressure gradient or by calculating the volume, and you say you have the pressure gradient at maybe 80 hertz, what will happen if you cross over to the top speakers at 90 and cross the subwoofer out at 70? Then you'll get a notch at 80. And you will not have have something that excites that pressure note. And that is what we're working on with, with our subwoofers. And I think that will be something for next year. But I think that that is a great possibility of integration with, uh, with, with subwoofers into, into high-end audio systems. And, and yes. And and we will start. We will start bringing out. We are making now amplification, and we will start bringing out a preamp, which will have this subwoofer filter built in. So, so this is pointing to the future, to bigger speaker models and to subwoofers uh, for our existing range. But we also have to look at that that this Corona thing has changed how people use their homes. I, 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 I predict a great rise over the next time when people start to realize that going to theaters is difficult and uh, big movies are starting to premiere their new movies uh, in, in the streaming. I think that home theaters will grow again. Not, 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 not uh, but as a two channel where we can run, where we can create where we can create something. I think that, that integration of picture and sound doesn't need to have multiple speakers and dedicated rooms. You can have a very good TV and take, take from streaming there, use the TV or projector, whatever, and have two good channels and get fantastic experience with stereo. So, so that is how we, how we see that for the vast majority of users for for home theater-like solutions, not necessarily going down the route of the uh, big Dolby systems, the Atmos or whatever. That is not that is that is not our business. We are very much a two-channel company. I, I think what what we have seen or what we see now is that that streaming is getting really mature. So, so streaming is now surpassing CD in quality, and I think I would two years back I wouldn't see that. And I think also we see great developments in in in, in turntables and vinyl. So I think my my take of this is that you will pretty much maybe also a little bit reel to reel, but I think the reel to reel is still for the select few, so to speak. But I think vinyl, vinyl will grow a lot, and I think it's. I think actually it will be difficult or, or dangerous for the high-end business to start to push the reel-to-reel -reel tapes, because because then you will chase away those that are actually capable of 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 entering into high-end through the streaming and maybe through a turntable, which is not such an imposing thing to have standing there in front as a real to real tape. So so so, so in, in my scenario, the the future lies very much in, in in the vinyl getting back, getting stronger, and the streaming is getting better. I, I think I, I I believe that when you do anything in this business, your you you your job is to get out of the way. So, so I think that that if somebody has a very good amplifier that they like the sound of, I think my speakers or our speakers would 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 suit them well. I I I, I think that this clarity that we have achieved with the iron free uh, drivers is so remarkable. It's it, it, for me, it's like making a a very very good set of headphones with that transparency the headphones have. But all of a sudden you have all the energy and capabilities in a room. So, so, so I think that there are 
uh, actually many good amplifiers, uh, actually many good sources out there that never gets the chance to, to show how good they are. But of, but of course, we, we, we promote the AVIC and the ANSU stuff, which is where we come from. This is, this is, uh, this is, these are our products. So of course, we refine them and polish on them and try to make them as good as possible. Um, but yeah, but, 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 but I have made setups with solution amplifiers, with boulder amplifiers, with the uh, Shetty's tube amplifiers, with the, uh, with, with a lot FM acoustics also. Yeah. So, so there are many good amplifiers out there and, and many good, yeah. Yeah, I think we have uh, now signed up a distributor for Canada. And uh, I think that is running quite good, actually. So I'm not really aware of how many shops he's, he's into now. And, and we, have, we have, I think, currently five shops in the U.S. that we are dealing with on a regular basic, but of basis. But I think that, that the name is the bars and the speakers are quite new. So, so yeah. The U.S. market, the U.S. market, to be honest, is a little bit, it's a little bit odd. Really, it used to be very big for Rido, and then all of a sudden, not very big. But I think there was a contraction in the economy, or something happened. Uh, and I think also that uh, that Dantax oversold, so all of a sudden there were too many dealers. They were fighting too much on price. So what we have done one, done with these speakers is that we have not giving it to anybody that just wants it. So we, uh, as I said before, we have to get out of the way. So if I make something with a certain preference, that will jeopardize all, all my efforts really. So, so, so no, but, but, but I listen to a lot of music. I have a, me I have a membership so I can listen to classical music. And I do that a lot in the daytime when I'm just as it's just playing. <laughs> Essentially, like YouTube, you get the next track and the next track and the next track, and I don't really. But I listen, and sometimes I stop off and said, "Wow, that was a very good violinist," and then he played the winter part from the, uh, the uh, from the Four Seasons, and uh, the solo there is just magnificent, and that was just there, and. Then I heard Port his head or <laughs> uh, the dire straits or, or yeah I heard, I, I, I heard a lot of music. 